Welcome to the final burst uh, for history, aftermath of the Civil War, solving the Indian problem. Right, as you should be aware now, if you've watched previous history bursts, um, the American country is now almost complete. The government have, post the Civil War, looked at protecting the new rights of the newly freed slaves. They have encouraged expansion by supporting use of the railroads and development of the networks. The government has um, promised land to those who are brave enough to settle on the Great Plains, the homesteaders, um, to help encourage fulfillment of Manifest Destiny. And what we see now is what to do with the Indians. Um, they remain on smaller reservations, making way for increasing numbers of settlers over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And so it's what to do with the Indians now. Um, we have treaties which have been unsuccessful to a certain degree in the past, and you have two in front of you. Um, so on the left, resolving the Indian problem by 1865, so end of the Civil War, we have that change in attitude towards the West, um, as well as attitude changes towards the Indians. American government previously agreed that the plains should be one big reservation uh, so that the Indians could be left alone to follow their traditional way of life. However, um, the government is now creating a fully developed reservation system, splitting up the large tribes and forcing them to live on small reservations. Remember, the Plains Indians way of life is traditionally nomadic, hunter-gatherer based, to live all year round on one small piece of land would be the complete opposite of what they're used to. So you need to think about how some tribes and bands may react to this forced reservation life. Um, so the Indians, this Indian problem in inverted commas, it's because they're seen as being in the way of the complete fulfillment of Manifest Destiny. They are in the way of progress uh, with uh, the development of the railroads. Um, and so the Indians are seen as more of a, a threat to these high ideals. So a couple of treaties that are um, agreed in the 1860s, shortly after the end of the Civil War, Medicine Lodge and Fort Laramie, the second one. So as always, you can pause uh, to read through a little bit more thoroughly and take away some contextual knowledge for further uh, thought and development. Um, so Medicine Lodge Treaty ends this one big reservation um, and it puts in place um, some conditions, it, it formalises, if you will, this small reservation policy. Um, you know, Plains Indians living outside the reservation will be forced onto the reservation by the military, so they'll be escorted under armed guard using violence if necessary. Um, Indians are encouraged on the reservation to give up their traditional ways and their traditional beliefs to assimilate to become more American, uh, for example, cut their hair so it would look American, wear American style clothes, um, learn to speak English rather than their native tongues, learn to read and write, which again is something not part of traditional Indian culture. And the government supports this idea of assimilation by setting up boarding schools where Indian children are ultimately forced um, but under the guise of encouraged to attend so that they cannot be educated in their traditional ways of life by their elders and are taught how to be more American. And the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, uh, the American government agrees to close the Bozeman Trail and abandon its forts across the West. Red Cloud and the Sioux realised that they could not beat the American government in the long term and they agree to move on to these smaller reservations in the South uh, Dakota Hills. Um, in return, the government is going to promise to supply the Sioux on the reservation with food and medicine. Sounds great in theory, but ultimately uh, it swings back to the fact that the government ultimately don't keep these promises consistently and that will develop further in the burst. Um, so just a quick slide to show you geographically 
um, how the traditional lands of the Plains Indians are over time encroached upon and pinched and pushed back and made smaller. So you can see how tensions would rise as the perceived threat of the Indians to the American government's progress um, is, is geographically uh, kind of dealt with and you know that that freedom to, to roam as they had once done is eroded over time quite significantly. Um, we have to this Indian problem idea uh, a couple of different attitudes if you will, some more moderate some more extreme um, and as you can see there um, people's opinions are divided between those who wants to, to exterminate the Indian population literally eradicate them and those who wanted just to, to move them out of the way of progress to move them out of the way of the railroads and manifest destiny and the homesteaders so a little bit more moderate there and again as always you can pause the video uh, and read around the exterminators uh, and what they were pushing for and how they were going to achieve the total removal of the Indians, uh, as well as the humanitarians who are your more moderate kind of wanting to work with the Indians and provide for them uh, or not, as the case was of the exterminators. Um, so this pushback, this putting onto small reservations, this armed escort onto these lands if they were unwilling. Um, the realisation is that many Plains Indians knew they couldn't beat the American government in the long term. And so they agreed to treaties like Medicine Lodge and Fort Laramie in exchange for much needed supplies. Remember, there's increasing populations on the plains. Uh, that, so there's competition for water sources, for the buffalo herds, the meat, the provisions. And so times are hard regardless of how you gather what you need. Um, but the conditions on the reservations are so poor that starvation and terrible diseases were common. So as a result, many Plains Indians, such as the Sioux Red Ch uh, Chief Red Cloud, who had signed at Fort Laramie in 1868, uh, agreed to humiliating conditions, such as sending their children away to boarding schools. Uh, they are really in quite a lot of distress, these families and tribes. Um, and we have General William T. Sherman, uh, who was a Civil War leader, who um, was stationed in the West and um, given the task of protecting the railroad. Um, and he was an exterminator. Uh, so this man in a position of power, um, you know, uh, used the Fort Laramie Treaty as an opportunity to be increasingly harsh towards the Indians in the land where he was stationed. And um, the exterminators were very keen to push through their plans. One way in which is the extermination of the buffalo. Uh, remember, buffalo hunting amongst the plains was for survival. They only killed what they needed. They were respectful. However, this extermination of the buffalo was not even just for sport, but people were hired to literally go and kill as many buffalo as they could uh, in order to remove the food supply and further humiliate and um, make suffer the Plains Indians so that they could not even uh, do some of their traditional way of life. Um, so much so that by 1890 there is hardly any buffalo left on the Plains. Uh, there were millions uh, at the start of the era. There's perhaps about half a million left <clears throat> if we're to estimate on that. Um, and the Indian Appropriations Act of 1871, um, it removes the independence under the law of the Indians. It takes away the need for the government to try to make treaties. So it's ultimately because they don't recognise the Indian nations as being an independent power, they just have to follow the law that the, the government dictates to them. Uh, so it brings Indian affairs under the control of the government in order to solve the Indian problem. Um, and Battle of the Little Bighorn, previously mentioned in a burst, it is significant. It is significant in the fact that the Indians win. So you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with how ultimately the Indians and the problem they present to the American government is solved if the Indians have just won this massive battle um, and humiliated the uh, American soldiers? It's the backlash. And as you in a moment read through some of these slides that talks about the 
battle itself. It's the fact that the Indians who win, uh, the reaction from the white American government and the soldiers is so um, vehement that they want revenge for this defeat, that that is the ultimate downfall of the Indian nations who are continuing to resist. And so you have in front of you a brief rundown of the battle itself, uh, which are, you can read at your leisure, um, having paused the video perhaps, and you've got the two protagonists there, Custer, uh, who led the American charge, and then you've got Crazy Horse, who is the Indian chief, who is um, uh, leading the Indian nations um, against Custer, uh, because this battle transforms the American government policy towards the Indians after their defeat by the Sioux, uh, the American government and the American public. They're, it's basically enough's enough. No more nice, no more talking around the table, no more trying to encourage through the law um, the assimilation of the Indians. It's like gloves are off. Uh, and so you have here, and I'm not going to read it all through because you have eyes and you can pause the video, but you have the chronology of the background to the battle, um, which has been building for some time, starting with the railroad that is now laying tracks through the traditional Lakota Sioux hunting grounds in Dakota. And you have miners, uh, thousands of them heading through the Black Hills where gold has been discovered. Um, so it's that disruption to their life, and I will encourage you to pause and read on. OK, so hopefully you've paused and read some of that background chronology. chronology. In the exam, you could well be asked, what is the significance or the reason for the downfall of uh, the Indian nations was mainly to do with the Battle of the Little Bighorn or the extermination of the buffalo. So you need to know um, why it was that Custer lost, the Indians won and the consequences of it. So you have an argument here that it was Custer's, Custer's fault uh, for ignoring instructions. And the next few slides, I am going to insist that you uh, pause, have a read and have a think of, of how uh, this particular factor would encourage um, Custer to lose or the Indians to win. Again, hopefully you've read through argument one and here you have arguments two and three as to why the loss at Big Horn was the American soldiers led by Custer's fault. Um, so again, pause the video, read, think about of the three arguments so far, which one you might consider to be more significant in encouraging the loss to the Indians that would be so humiliating for America, but long term devastating for the Indians because of the backlash. OK, so you've looked at three arguments. Uh, here are two further arguments as to um, why perhaps it's not Custer's fault. So argument four, um, in the sense that it's because the Indians were just too good. Um, they were outnumbered. And then argument five, that it's bad luck. So you can't blame Custer the man. It's luck that was not on his side. So again, I will encourage you to pause uh, the video, have a read of these two further arguments. And again, return to your original three. Have you changed your mind? Which argument would you say is the most significant uh, in considering the loss of uh, Custer to the Indians? Which one um, perhaps is the least significant in, in the loss at Bighorn? OK, so you have considered five reasons as to why Custer lost at the Battle of the Little Bighorn uh, to a much smaller Indian group of soldiers. Consequences, as always, in history causes of the battle uh, and then consequences is what happens as a result. And you have listed uh, consequences and the changes to governmental policy in the face of this very public, uh, very humiliating defeat of the American army to the Indian soldiers, um, warriors, apologies. Um, so we have public opinion, no longer supporting a peaceful um, resolution to the Indian problem. The Indians are an increasing threat because they have this win under their belt, uh, a bit like David and Goliath. 
and the American government is now in advanced stages of now crushing any further resistance because they don't want a repeat of Big Horn. So it leads to the Doors Act being passed, the Ghost Dance Movement and the Massacre at Wounded Knee, which will come up shortly. To some, Custer's a hero, um, but President Grant blames Custer totally. Changes to the government policy, treaties are now ignored. Indians are moved onto even smaller uh, reservations into even worse conditions. And the military makes great efforts to keep the Plains Indians on their reservations by starving them or stealing their horses and ammunition. Uh, so the intensity of the um, restrictions placed upon the Indians uh, uh, has new vigour because of the American defeat at Bighorn. Uh, more felt, uh, forts are built across the West and the government exploits the Indians' need for food and supplies to get them to finally give up their land, coupled with um, the extermination of the buffalo herds. That's going to support that particular government policy in the longer term. Um, we see as a result of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, as briefly mentioned, just we have, um, you know, that idea that the Americans are now, we're going to get rid of all of the old ways of the Plains Indians. Uh, and the Doors Act is something that does that. So you have in front of you um, a summary of what reservation life was like before the Battle of the Little Big Horn. So you can see and pause the video and remind yourself some of the conditions take away uh, three or four uh, pieces of AO1 knowledge to uh, keep under your belt so that you can judge the change uh, to this particular way of life for the Indians now as a result of the Battle of the Little Big Horn and the Doors Act. And here you have the Doors Act. So what did the Act say? It splits the reservations into small units of land known as allotments. The allotments are given to individual tribes and to farm. A little bit other like homesteads are around about 160 acres. Uh, and the Act changed the legal status of the Plains Indians from members of tribes to American individuals, just like everybody else. White Americans, they were freed slaves, they're all on a level playing field. So there's no kind of special circumstances for the Indians that had previously happened. Um, Plains Indians who accepted the small units of land are allowed to become American citizens and enjoy the rights and protections like everybody else. Um, and the Act creates state funded boarding schools where Indian children are forced to go to learn to be more American. There's that forced uh, removal of the children. And so in the green, you can see some analysis of how the Indians may have responded um, to some of these um, elements of the Doors Act and the consequences. So, you know, they have to farm on small farms like the homesteaders. They don't have the skills to farm. So it's like setting them up to fail because they're warriors. They don't know how to farm the land. They don't know how to work a plow. They don't know how to build a sod house. Um, you know, so it breaks up that community spirit that the, you know, the good of the tribe, the survival of the tribe is based on everybody doing their bit. You're now broken down into small working units, so you don't have that support system anymore uh, within the old Indian way of life. Um, and you can again pause and read through in more detail the impact on children and the impact on you know that, that farming of the land. Uh, and President Cleveland at the time thought that he was doing the right thing by getting the Plains Indians off the isolated reservations and kind of into the community. He would argue that their quality of a life would improve and that they would help them assimilate into American culture more quickly. Obviously, um, that's up for you to decide. All right, uh, one of the last hurrahs of the Indians is Wounded Knee. Um, and so it's almost like literally the last dying death of, of, uh, of resistance. As always, you can pause and have a little read for yourself. But Wounded Knee, it's, it, it, it is, it's a last ditch attempt, attempt to be independent because, you know, after the Battle of the Little Big Horn, things go downhill for the Indians. Indian resistance peters out. The military harassment of Indians continues and the army massacres up to 300 Lakota Sioux at Wounded Knee. Um, because of that massacre, the ghost dance movement, as described there, is this idea that he had a vision, Wavoka, um, telling him that the Plains Indians had angered the Great Spirit, who was angry because they'd abandoned their traditional, traditional ways of life, which had led to their defeat at Wounded Knee. Um, so Wavoka claimed that if they danced the sacred ghost dance and rejected the American ways, the Great Spirit would bring back 
to life all Dead Plains Indians who would then help them defeat the white man uh, and restore their traditional way of life. Um, the ghost dance movement becomes very popular very quickly on the reservations, um, which again would worry the American government quite quickly. So President Harrison at the time sent the military in to stop the ghost dance and you can read what happens. Um, in December of 1890, where reservation police try to arrest Sitting Bull, who, you know, is thinking the ghost dance um, and, and is about to lead a rebellion. Um, Sitting Bull refuses to go quietly and is ultimately shot dead, uh, which angers his followers uh, who flee south, join Chief Bigfoot. And then by uh, almost the new year, 29th of December, uh, the American Army, the 7th Cavalry, who had fought at Battle of the Little Bighorn a few years prior, caught up with Bigfoot and St. Ball's followers at Wounded Knee Creek. Uh, so we have this um, kind of last stand and ultimately um, the resistance peters out. So again, pause the video and, and, and take away two to three things about the reactions to Wounded Knee. Um, you know, the ghost dance is over, so white Americans are relieved. Um, you know, it gives this idea that the soldiers were heroes who did the right thing in the newspapers. Um, it confirms to the American public that the Indians are wild savages, uh, can't be controlled, so need to be kind of put out of their misery, put down. Um, and it's the last major violent confrontation at Wounded Knee between the American government soldiers and the Plains Indians. Um, so, and with that, you have the closure officially, legally, of the Indian frontier. Which, you know, is a quiet kind of conclusion. Um, you know, by 1890, the West is settled, the plains is filled, railroads and towns are covering that great American desert. Plains Indians had lost the struggle for the plains and the frontier, um, which means the land that they had once held as Indian Territory was now open to everyone. And we see a bit of a, a land rush in the late 1880s. Um, two million acres of land that previously belonged to the Indians is now basically come and get it offer to uh, white settlers. Um, and it's settled pretty much instantly within 24 hours. So to take away, you need to be aware of what is it that ultimately uh, means that the Indian resistance, the Indian way of life is all but eradicated and they are defeated in their final um, kind of um, resistance to the encroachment of the American way of life and manifest destiny on the Plains Indians' traditional way of life. So you can go down the military route, such as Battle of the Little Big Horn, Wounded Knee. You could use the reservation policy uh, of assimilating the children, uh, removing their ability to traditionally hunt, forcing them to become farmers. Um, the um, impact of the railroad network that was government funded, um, the aftermath of the Civil War uh, and the demand for land from ex farmers freed slaves that increased the pressure on the traditional way of life of the Indians and those ultimate original culture clashes between Manifest Destiny making use of the land and the Indians' position as kind of caretakers. So again, as always, you can pause this penultimate slide and take away some threads um, uh, uh, about what it is that actually sees the downfall of the Indian way of life um, alongside things like the buffalo extermination, etc. And finally, Important to remember that the life on the plains was hard. Difficult conditions meant that everyone had to struggle to survive and attitude towards others was harsh. And as time went on, attitudes on both sides hardened. So by the time the horror of the Civil War is over, you have uh, weary people who are fed up with, fed up with um, uh, conditions being really difficult. They are uh, suffering on the aftermath of the war and trying to rebuild their lives. And so any tension, any source of conflict, any perceived threat to their survival is magnified. And that is what you see with this um, ultimate decline of the Indian way of life um, post the Civil War. <laughs>